the price of oil collapses in 2014, and that has led to a massive crisis of proportions that we haven't seen uh, in the country before in terms of the economics. Uh, basically, you know, the decline, even though we don't have official figures for the uh, last year uh, and a half, um, the GDP per capita decline is estimated at around 28% decline. To give you an idea, only a few countries in the world with civil wars have had such uh, uh, a massive decline in short, uh, short, uh, short period of time. Poverty has increased uh, uh, dramatically. And of course, this is combined now with a political crisis because this regime became increasingly authoritarian um, in 1915, um, um, uh, in, in sorry, in 2015, uh, we had um, uh, elections in which the opposition won a massive majority, in fact, a two-third majority in the assembly. And basically, since then, there has been a dramatic confrontation uh, between uh, the, the assembly and the other uh, powers of the government that are controlled by the president, uh, President Maduro, who is the successor of Hugo Chavez. Last week, uh, we had in Venezuela an event that has led to a, a, a heightening uh, a crisis. Basically, the Supreme Court of Venezuela, particularly the, the Constitutional Chamber of the Supreme Court of Venezuela, uh, this made two decisions that created a lot of upheaval. First, it basically decided that the um, uh, legislature uh, did not have you know, any authority to basically do anything because they uh, declare that it was on contempt uh, of, uh, of the court, and, um, and the immunity that from prosecution that uh, Venezuelan legislatures have uh, constitutionally uh, was you know, basically removed. On top of that, uh, and surprisingly uh, uh, together, they um, announced that from now on, all the decisions that have to do with the oil industry, in particular changes in the hydrocarbons law of Venezuela, and in the joint ventures between uh, PDVSA, the national oil company, and uh, foreign companies, that those did not have to go through the National Assembly. And that basically the president has full powers to sell, uh, uh, to change contracts, to change fiscal uh, rules. And that happens in a, in a context in which the government is desperate for money, and uh, in which there are uh, significant rumors of uh, uh, deals with uh, the Russian company Rothneft. So that creates a lot of uh, um, uh, suspicion about what was uh, behind uh, these two decisions. That generated a massive international outcry, which to me was somehow surprising in the sense that already most of these things were, you know, the, the National Assembly did not have uh, any power. Uh, but clearly that um, uh, uh, made the government realize that they, uh, that, that they had crossed sort of a line. And so the president convened a meeting of the, um, of the defense council, which is not supposed to be for these things, and basically suggested to the court that they retracted uh, their decision. And they did uh, the same night, um, uh, but without uh, taking away the power in the oil sector. Uh, which is a, a pretty, uh, you know, relevant uh, issue. This decision by the court opens up the possibility of the Venezuelan government doing an opening of the oil sector, uh, but uh, which companies are going to be willing to participate uh, given that the National Assembly of Venezuela is declaring that everything, any deal that, that is done under this condition is illegal. Uh, and the thing is that, of course, very few players will be willing to do that. Um, in fact, the, uh, there is the notion that the Russians, the company Rovniev that has been, become the, one of the biggest players in Venezuela, is the one that demanded having this kind of legal uh, uh, approval from the Supreme Court to go ahead with some of the deals. Uh, so, but one wonders if these events actually have not generated even more legal uncertainty uh, than we had uh, before. And so, as a result, I think we will have uh, limited uh, effectiveness uh, in terms of uh, uh, attracting new investment, that despite the significant pragmatism that we're seeing today in the government. More recently, there has been a very interesting development, which is that Mexico, which is, uh, has had traditionally for a long time 
two sort of basic tenets in their uh, relationship with Latin America. One is non-intervention in the affairs of uh, other countries. And second, uh, um, very uh, good relationship with the Cuban uh, regime. Um, uh, the, the, the government of Mexico and, and the PRI, a ruling PRI, has made a significant uh, switch in policy in which Luis Videgaray, the new foreign minister from Mexico, because he wants to align himself with, in some foreign policy issues with the US because of the difficult Mexican-US relationship that we have today, Mexico is becoming one of the leaders in the Venezuelan issue in the OAS, which I think is a very good development for Venezuela because Mexico can uh, exert uh, a leadership in the region because of that is the largest Spanish speaking country in the region. Um, and, and I think that will be a, a, a good uh, development uh, because of uh, um, uh, the limitations that other, for example, the Brazilian government can have a very significant role too, but the, the Brazilian government has an interim president that is in the midst of a political uh, crisis, so they don't have uh, that much room to maneuver. Of course, Mexico is not in the easiest of times, but they, they do have more legitimacy to act in this uh, uh, regard. Some relevant international allies outside of the region, in particular Russia, who has been very active in Venezuela and has uh, given a lifeline to the Venezuelan government in financially in terms of avoiding uh, uh, default. And also China, uh, which although has been moving a little bit away of, uh, uh, of Venezuela and being much more careful in their involvement in Venezuela, uh, China has significant interest in Venezuela. It's the, uh, the largest uh, um, uh, loan uh, provider to Venezuela. So, uh, so these two players uh, uh, are relevant and, and can ease, uh, in some ways, the, the, the pressure to the country. Internally, repression has been very severe. The Venezuelan government has become very effective in repression. And, and that has made it really difficult for the opposition uh, to, to protest. Also, media is controlled uh, by the government. Uh, uh, use, uh, there is absolute censorship of what you can see on Venezuelan TV today. And the press is uh, basically in, in very bad shape because the government does not allow them to uh, get uh, a paper. So uh, the situation is, is very difficult internally. But the opposition, even though it has had difficulties uh, uniting, they, they have been good at uniting electorally, but not uh, uh, in an, an strategy towards the government. Because of the recent events and uh, being emboldened by the international reaction, uh, the opposition has uh, sort of revived itself. Uh, let's see if that leads or not, that combination of external forces and internal forces, to the type of change that the, the country needs, which are, you know, reinstitutionalizing democracy, having, you know, free and fair uh, uh, elections, uh, getting uh, to do the economic reforms that are needed to avoid this uh, humanitarian tragedy that Venezuela is living today. The country has been in, in, a, in a massive economic collapse for a while, and we expected that something that, that would trigger some sort of uh, reaction in terms of change in policies, in terms of uh, understanding that uh, with the political conflict, it's very hard to deal with these uh, massive economic challenges. But we haven't seen that. Uh, we have seen a continued economic decline. There's almost very limited policy change in the economic sphere. Um, you know, conflict between the pr public and the private sector. So, uh, the, unfortunately, if the political crisis is not resolved in, in any way, where we are likely to see it's more repression, more economic decline, more emigration outside of, of Venezuela, and uh, potentially a situation that could not only destabilize, of course, the country, which is almost a failed state at this point, uh, but also uh, the neighboring countries. It's an economic catastrophe uh, that, uh, as mentioned, we haven't seen in the, in the region before, combined with the first reversal 
of, of a country from democracy to authoritarianism that we have seen since the sort of third wave of democratization that we had in the, in the 80s. There is only one other country, Nicaragua, that seems to be following that uh, dramatic authoritarian path. So uh, this is a very, very relevant uh, uh, um, event, not only for, of course, Venezuelans, but for the region, because a country that used to be uh, one of the democratic beacons of the region and that used to be one of the richest countries of the region, falling totally apart and uh, uh, breaking uh, and having this breakup of democracy uh, could have also effects in other uh, countries in the region if it's not uh, managed properly by the international community.